Good morning, BBC family. What a privilege and an honor and a blessing to come into your homes this morning to be able to share in a time of fellowship and worship together today. I do have a few things I want to make you aware of, uh, some, just some announcements for us. Uh, all of you that had planned on serving with us in Vacation Bible School, uh, we've shifted our dates into July. So if you're still willing to serve, if you would please let our directors know or let um, our office know, that would just help us as we continue to plan. Uh, as we know, in this season, everything fluid. Our expectation is July, the week of July 13th, but we'll just have to see uh, how things go with that. Our men's mission team, the expectation for them is to head out on Saturday, June the 20th to head up to Indiana. Uh, if you're interested in participating in that mission trip, you do let Jason Brown or uh, Brett Hart know. I know that they would appreciate that. Um, our Annie Armstrong total is $2,662 towards our goal of $3,000. Thank you so much for giving faithfully uh, to the the Annie Armstrong Easter offering to help out with North American missions. AJ asked that I would announce for our seniors that are graduating this year, if you could get those videos to him. He's putting together uh, a video series so that we can recognize our seniors this year. Again, a little bit different. We're having to do things a little bit differently. Um, and then uh, be watching either your inbox tomorrow morning or your mailbox in the next couple of days. We need to begin the process of establishing a search team to uh, find somebody to, I can't even believe I'm saying this, replace Benny Boggess. He'll never be replaced, uh, but looking for that person that God has put out there for us. So what we'll need you to do is, is to just follow those instructions either in the email or the letter that you receive. Uh, if for some reason you don't receive one of those, just call the office. Uh, the procedure is very simple. We'll go for a couple of weeks, try to have uh, all that information turned into the office by uh, May the 17th is our expectation. And speaking of May the 17th, I would ask church family if you would do me a favor this morning and specifically pray for wisdom. We really wanted to gather together on May the 17th, do a couple of services. But for those of you that listened to the governor's announcement this week, uh, our shelter in place order has passed. But then there's this expectation that uh, the those of us that uh, fall into the category of either medically fragile or 65 and older, they're asking that shelter in place to be extended into June. And so with that in mind, we, we need to be thinking about what the 17th, May the 17th looks like. Um, so just be praying for us. Uh, we'll be trying to get some more information out this week as we talk with leadership, as we go through that process. But we just really need your prayers uh, to be wise because the, the first reason we made the decision to not meet together was because we really are concerned about our senior adults, our medically fragile. We don't want to take any chance of you guys uh, getting sick. So just be praying for us again. I've said it three times. I'll say it one more, right? Uh, pray for us that we we would make the wise decision. But now we are in the moment. Now we have an opportunity to come together as the body of Christ to worship our Father. And what a great privilege and blessing it is for us to do that in our homes this morning. So I encourage you to sing as you praise and worship the Lord together with your family today or as you're by yourself in your own home. Just sing and worship the Lord. And now let's turn our hearts to the Lord as we pray together uh, as AJ comes and leads us. Good morning, BBC family. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity, the opportunity to be in your presence. Lord, that your presence is not secluded to a building, uh, but that your presence is everywhere, that your presence is with us and in us. And Lord, that you would use us and work through us for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, as we come to this time right now, Lord, that we would give it to you that we would surrender um, our minds to you uh, to limit distraction, uh, but to also just surrender this time in thankfulness for all that you've done. Lord, you are worthy of our worship and our praise. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give it. We pray that you would receive it, um, even in our uh, human nature uh, where we fall short. Lord, you carry us beyond that. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Uh, Lord, as we sing praises to you today, Lord, pray that we would do it with a whole heart. Um, as we open the word of God, that we would receive your truth and listen carefully. Lord, as we come to your scripture today in Acts 10, that we would be mindful of the fact that you are um, a loving God and you love us so much that you would be willing to accept us all for salvation. And Lord, I uh, thank you that you 
show us that, but also thank you for the unity that is displayed through Scripture. And Lord, that that unity would be true in our own lives. Lord, that as we think about the BBC family, that we would be a shining light of unity in this community and um, a, a shining light of love of, of what Jesus has done for us. So Lord, be with us today, and thank you so much for all that you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. singing. We invite you now to watch the following video, a report from our debt elimination team. Good morning, BBC Church family. In the last week, a week and a half, we've had a lot of encouraging news, per cautiously optimistic about things returning to some sort of level of normal. Uh, with businesses begin to open up and the uh, hope that maybe we can meet together as a church family in person uh, sometime in the month of May. Um, so we wanted to just come to you uh, this month uh, as a, an entire committee, uh, just offer you one, maybe one more note of encouragement uh, this month by just sharing some observations that we've had throughout this debt process. We've prayed about this and worked through it for the last 20 months together as a church family. And just wanted to share maybe something that's really struck home with us. Well, I'll share first, Daniel, and I've been encouraged through this whole process by the number of people who have participated 
I had the office run some numbers and there, since we started this in September of 18, we've had 194 individual givers participate in the debt elimination campaign. And I think that's fantastic. You look across the church body and I know that at least 194 of those people are giving toward debt elimination. And some of those numbers represent whole families. So it's been very encouraging to me to find out how much buy-in there's really been in the church family. Daniel, I'm thankful that we haven't had to sell sheets or wash cars or do any other fundraising campaigns like we initially thought that would be needed. Due to our faithful giving, we've been blessed beyond expectation. Praise God, he's bigger than my expectations and probably the rest of the church's expectations. Yeah, my uh, moment of encouragement through this process was something that happened early on in the campaign and it was something that was completely or uh, organic. It was a coin collection. Uh, it started from just uh, a Sunday school class, one of the children's classes, just wanting to contribute at some level and it spread throughout the church. We saw buy-in through all ages and just it was a neat time to see the collection amount grow from a visual standpoint week after week. So just really encouraged by the, the number of people who were able to contribute to that. And then just a good time of fellowship, just co counting out a bunch of uh, coins at the end of the process. Daniel, my faith has been strengthened. Um, as a group of people, we went at a task that I didn't really have a lot of faith in, but to see God move and to see the numbers shrink like they have, it's just truly amazed me. Uh, I'm thankful to be a member of a body that would give, especially at times like this. And uh, I can't wait to see what God has for us uh, in the next quarters. Daniel, I'll have to admit that when I was approached to serve on the committee and presented with the challenge, I was a little bit skeptical about how we could achieve this goal and how it would be received by our church family. Um, through God's grace, it has far exceeded my expectations. Um, within the committee, Beverly and I were challenged to make contact with 40 years worth of Bowden Baptist kindergarten attendees and their families. And um, it was just so overwhelming to me. And I don't know how we would have done it without technology but um, we were able to contact a big percentage of those um, families uh, with the help of our other committee members. And we had an overwhelming response from, from those families. And um, like I said, God's grace has far ex exceeded my expectations and I've received such a blessing of working with the other members of this committee. Well, like everyone else, I've been blown away by the, uh, the numbers uh, over the past year and a half and over uh, the past month. I'm uh, proud to be a part of this committee, and I think we all know that our church, uh, Sunday School Education Annex, is the front lines of our uh, ministry, and I'm proud to be a part uh, of this committee. Well, for me, having the opportunity to serve on this committee has been gratifying experience, and I will always remember there are few opportunities that come along to work for a good goal such as this to benefit and provide for growth of the church. Um, it's been very satisfying to be able to see our debt decrease. And uh, for me personally, I've grown spiritual with this committee and on this goal. And I praise and thank God for the opportunity. And it's truly been a blessing in my life. Well, thank you all for being willing to share, and we hope um, this has been a, a note of encouragement to you, church family, um, as we come to you via technology this morning. So we wanted to just close our time today by sharing our thank monthly you, numbers. Thank team, for your hard work. Thank you for sharing with us this morning. Congregation, we now invite you to join with us as we sing a hymn that reminds us of how important it is to tell and demonstrate the love of Christ to our community and surroundings. Join with me as we sing Rescue the Perishing.
as we come to a time of worship and being able to give to the Lord, that we would think about what we've already been talking about. Uh, the blessing of seeing our debt elimina elimination team uh, share with us just the faithfulness of God and the fact that you have continued to be faithful. And uh, even through that, that we, as we go to the Lord in prayer today, uh, that we would be reminded of his faithfulness, that as we may give a little, uh, he multiplies and exceeds beyond anything we could imagine. And that would be continued uh, in our giving and uh, Lord, also as we think about, once again, just the opportunity uh, to give to the Lord uh, because of all that he's given us. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you through giving. Uh, Lord, that we would remain faithful as you've remained faithful to us. Lord, all with the, the realization and understanding that everything that we give is for the promotion of the gospel. Uh, Lord, that your name would go forth and that people would come to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, so help us to be diligent in that and being reminded of the fact that, uh, that we would love the lost. And so, Lord, let it be said of us. Lord, as we have this time today, thank you once again for the opportunity to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray together this morning. Father, what a great privilege it has been this morning just to to rest in you, to be still and know that you're God. Father, as we come now to open your word, we ask that you would speak clearly to us. What a great account of what experience Peter had to go through, Cornelius had to go through, and Father, the shift in thinking sometimes we have to go through. Father, thank you that you remind us, as we've talked about for the last few weeks, that no matter what the situation or circumstance, the trial, the tribulation, you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Father, we just ask that you would, as always, speak through your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, and help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers, and see how this truth impacts our lives today. Father, we love you and thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On well, the book of Acts, we're in chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 10 this morning uh, to try to catch us up just a little bit. We saw the church begin its expansion and its growth through tribulation, right? Uh, facing persecution, the church was continuing to go forward, to move forward as uh, Philip and others were going forward and sharing the gospel. Uh, we saw Paul's conversion, and now we shift back to Peter's ministry. God has used him to work miraculously in the healing of one who was bedridden for eight years, paralyzed for eight years, and then we see uh, one being raised from the dead. In each one of those instances, as Peter was obedient, God was moving and working through those, and that as those miracles took place, uh, many people came to faith and many people believed in the Lord. And so as the gospel continues to move forward, uh, there's a challenge, and the Jewish believers were seeing this kind of show up uh, a little bit. We saw that with the institution of the first deacons or servers of tables because there were Hellenist Jews uh, or Hellenist widows who were not being ministered to. So we're seeing this growth of uh, ethnic diversity in uh, the church early on, and it's stretching the belief system of the, the early Hebrew converts, the early Hebrew Christian, Jewish Christians, however you want to identify those who had uh, come from Judaism, who had accepted Christ, but they were still kind of holding on to the traditions of and uh, the expectations of Judaism and trying to blend that with Christianity. So there were some struggles that were being faced, and it wasn't just being faced by those that were just kind of, for lack of a better term, sitting in the pews of the church. It was going all the way up to those that were in leadership. And so as we look at Peter's life today and his interaction with Cornelius, Cornelius, it really stretches our view of the gospel and kind of ask ourselves the question, who is worthy of receiving the gospel or who is worthy of us sharing the gospel with? I'll challenge you at the outset again and bring it back around as we close this morning. But why is it? that you haven't shared your testimony with somebody. And I'm not just talking about on social media. I encourage you to do that. Video yourself, type it out, whatever. But share your testimony so that people... Why haven't you shared your testimony with anyone? There are statistics show us that um, the vast majority of Christians have never shared their testimony, their conversion story with anyone. And 95% plus, depending on which, uh, which research you read or where you go, there are that many people that have never led anyone to faith in Jesus Christ. So there is this expectation that we share the good news. The, the great thing is a lot of you can share the gospel right there in your home. So I would encourage you around uh, the lunch table today, maybe share your testimony with your family of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ and share that good news with your children. Or maybe it's calling that friend or that relative that you know that doesn't know Christ and sharing that good news with them. So uh, we have to ask the question, are they, are they worthy of receiving that? And if they, if they are, then why haven't we shared that? And so this is a really interesting story. We talked about last week, miracles. I believe that what we read here is miraculous in God changing the heart and mind of Peter to share the good news of the gospel with Cornelius. So let's look at the passage of scripture a little bit longer than, than usual this morning, but it kind of wraps up the whole story and really will, really will set us up uh, for next week and really will transition us into our summer series. For those of you that are part of uh, Bowden Baptist Church for the last few years, we, we move into kind of a family series in the summertime with next um 
Next Sunday being Mother's Day, we want to recognize our moms the best way we can digitally uh, and acknowledge uh, you guys and what you do to influence and impact us. And uh, then we'll talk about our, our church family and the elders and our youth and our dads and just all the body of Christ and this great family that we have. But to me, this was a natural transition for us. And uh, to be quite honest, I'm, I'm looking forward to share one more uh, passage from Acts chapter 10 next week. We're going to kind of cut it in half and finish up Acts this passage this morning and not pick up the other part until uh, August. But we'll get to finish that up next week and you'll see where it connects. But the 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 backstory, right, of what was going on with Peter and Cornelius. So this is Acts chapter 10, beginning verse 1. It says, At Caesarea there was a man by the name of Cornelius, a centurion, uh, who was known as the, uh, as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him, he departed. He called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, letting down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out and asked whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the, on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was ex uh, expecting them. And had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. As he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So then when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been, has been heard. Your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Man, what a wonderful, wonderful account of the faithfulness of God, of him moving in the, life of the lives of a follower of Christ to be obedient, as we've talked about in the book of Acts, this theme that keeps running through. There's all these little themes that we see, and one of those themes is the obedience of God's people, that when they are called to do something, they do it, right? We've even seen the old Markian words, right? Immediately, they are responding and immediately following God, following uh, God's 
to baptism or to go to a place and serve. We looked at Philip uh, this morning in Sunday school briefly. He, he went down to Samaria and then he went to this desert road to be able to share with the Ethiopians. So we see uh, this, these acts of obedience over and over again as we move through the book of Acts. So the obedience of the believer, right, as God speaks to Peter, but then the receptiveness of one who doesn't really totally understand the message of the gospel. So just to me, it's just a beautiful image of the shift in thinking of what needs to take place in the life of a believer. That when we see Peter in this story, Peter has a preconceived notion, and that preconceived notion is grounded and rooted in his tradition, and to be quite honest, is grounded and rooted in his religion. And that's why we've stressed that and spent a lot of time talking about the difference between religion and relationship. We see the religious people that we've talked about in the book of Acts wanting to kill people. That doesn't sound like they have a real strong relationship with Jesus Christ to me, the one who talked about loving your neighbor as yourself. So there, there's a huge distinction between religion and relationship. Now we got to understand and we got to kind of got, got to give the Jews in the first century a break, right? They had learned this for generation after generation. It was the truth that they had experienced under the knowledge that they had from God, but now this new revelation in Jesus Christ has come. We call it a new covenant. The old covenant is grounded and rooted in the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, that God would do this work and he would bless the nation and bless his people. But now there's this shift that takes place. And when Jesus comes, he helps his disciples to understand that, yes, the message of salvation came to the Jew first, but it would also move to the Gentile. Well, we'll see this, and Peter doesn't overcome it just in this experience that we see him later on in a conversation with the Apostle Paul that he still really hasn't embraced that the gospel is available to everyone. And as AJ's already prayed and we've thought about, thought about and talked about this morning, is the gospel available to everyone? Is everyone worthy to receive the gospel? So let's, let's introduce ourselves to this man by the name of Cornelius. Luke takes the time to really spell out who he is. He's a centurion. He's part of the Italian cohort. He also is a devout man that fears God. So in this context and understanding what was going on in the first century, there were secular people, there were Gentiles who heard about Judaism, who heard about God, and they were like, man, that makes sense, right? There are some that uh, even today they have a logical understanding of Christianity that they can put A plus B together and get C and think, man, that, that makes sense. Christianity, when you lay it out against all other religions, that makes sense. And they may have a, a head knowledge of religion or they may have some kind of uh, understanding. I mean, they may kind of affirm that. It's kind of in our culture today, right? You can go out on the street today and say, how many people believe in God? And the vast majority of our culture are going to have some kind of belief in some kind of higher power, right? Well, uh, Cornelius was a little beyond that in that the scripture says he was devout, that he feared God, that he was faithfully worshiping God the way that he understood, right? He was giving alms to the poor. He was praying to God continually. So there is this, this idea, and the way I thought about it was, is he was the good soil, right? Jesus gave the parable, parable of the four soils, and basically that's the people you and I come in contact with really on a daily basis in our jobs or in social settings and uh, maybe even on social media if you're engaging in discussions. I had real, real close had an opportunity this week and I jumped. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't get involved in it because I didn't want to get engaged in the conversation. So some of you are, though, and you're doing it well, and I appreciate the way that you engage. But when, when we see this guy, that, that there are those four soils that Jesus talked about. He said some is, is rocky soil, that when we share the good news of the gospel, when we share the word of God, it bounces off and they don't receive it. Some is that, that thin soil, right, that it takes root and it springs up, but because there's no, no deep root, there's nothing for it to be grounded in, the sun comes and scorches it and it dies off. And then there are are others that the, the seed goes into the soil and it takes root and it begins to grow, but then there are all the, the weeds, right, and the thorns and the thistles and all the stuff of the world, as Jesus says, says in his parable, the things of the world come in and they choke that out. But then he says there is a good soil. There is a soil that's prepared to receive the, the good word. 
As we think about sharing the gospel, the reality is God is already at work in the hearts and minds of those that are coming to salvation. That for my situation, I, I was not aware that God was at work in my life. And when I started going to church for all the wrong reasons, God was at work through the preaching of the pastor, through the teaching of the student pastor, through the, the work of the people in the church of God, that, that my soil, for lack of better terms, was being tilled and it was being prepared so that when the gospel message was preached and proclaimed, I was receptive to it. So God was already at work. Well, that's who Cornelius is. God is already at work in his life. Life, that he is tilling that soil. He's receptive to who God is. He's studied. He's probably connected to a synagogue. It, it doesn't imply that he's already gone to make the step that he's Jewish, right? That he hasn't been circumcised and he's not fully a part of the Jewish culture, but he is pursuing understanding of who God is. So I would say that he is, uh, he is good soil. So that when God comes to him in the form of an angel and speaks to him and gives him uh, these clear instructions on what the next step for him is to do, that the reality is, is God is working that in the people that you're coming in contact with, the friends and family that you have. And again, during this situation, during uh, this, this trial that we're going through, that God is even using this as an opportunity to till soil because I believe people want to find hope. They want to find peace. And we've already seen that God's revealing himself through his son, Jesus Christ, through the church, that that's who he is. That even in the midst of persecution in the first century with the birth of the church, even though the church is being persecuted, we read it just last week that they were comforted in the Holy Spirit and the church was built up. And Luke even records that the church in the midst of persecution multiplied. And so whatever we're seeing from what we see as a negative situation, we reference this all the way back to Stephen's sermon, right? That Stephen, as he preached to the Jewish leaders of the day, to the Sanhedrin, he referenced Joseph and his whole story, how he was sold into slavery and how all these bad things happened in his life. And then finally he was in charge of all of Pharaoh's possessions and all of his lands. And then when his family was facing a trial, and they came into his court. And they were terrified because they realized, oh, this is our brother we sold into slavery. He says, what, what you guys meant for evil, God meant for good. So in, even in the trials and the tribulations, God is working all things together to the good of those that love him, to those that are called according to his purpose. So God is at work in Cornelius' life to prepare him so that when he speaks to him and he prepares him for this, uh, this visit from Peter, he's already prepared to receive the good news of the gospel. And so find hope in that. If, if God's placed somebody on your heart and God's speaking to you about somebody you need to share the gospel with, the, the reality is, is he is preparing them to receive that good news. But we got to be ready. Right? We can't have preconceived notions and we can't have preconceived expectations of how that's supposed to go. And then we see Peter in the story, right? Peter's been a rock. He's been a pillar, right? He's been a leader in the church. But he still has to have some shifting in his thinking. You know, that's one of the things that we're, we're experiencing in this season. We're having to change a lot. I, I'll, I'll testify of Benny since he's here. He said, man, I'm, I'm really realizing how old I really am. Right? That, that having to use technology and stretching outside of our comfort zones, it, it really has been a challenge. And he's not alone. It's, it's really difficult. And I know I'm, I know I'm in your living rooms because I know what's going on at my house. I'm, I know my kids right now, y'all are listening, right? Y'all are paying attention. You're behaving. Sorry, church family, I had to do that. Um, but I, I know that, that, that it's a challenge because I'm, I'm preaching to a camera, right? Like that's all that's looking at me is this little black box. But I know on the other side of that line through, through the technology we have that, that I'm in my church family's homes right now. And, but it's a challenge because I, I don't have Eddie back in the back amen in me or somebody out in the congregation, oh, me and me, whatever the case may be. So it is, these are all challenges, but God works through those. And we have these expectations that we have in our minds that this is the way things are supposed to go. So Peter, we can't throw him too quickly under the bus because the, the, the things that we go through in life, we're, we're just like Peter. We, we have to move and we have to shift. And when God changes things about the way we do things or the way we live life or, or even like Peter in the things that we believe, 
We have to yield to his authority and trust in him. So let's look at Peter now as God begins to speak to Peter. And Peter is, is revealed this truth in a, a little bit different way. So uh, look at verse 9. The next day, the, the guys are on their journey from uh, going down from Cornelius' house to Peter. Peter gets hungry. And so he goes to get ready for dinner. And while he's doing that, God allows him to fall into a trance. He gets to a position where he can hear the word of God. And this visual takes place. It's, it's really interesting if you just kind of look at what takes place. Peter sees this sheet coming down, right? It's lunchtime. He's hungry. And this sheet is coming down. And on it, though is all manner of animals, right? So under Jewish expectation, there were only certain things that they could eat. There were only things by Jewish tradition, Jewish law, that they were allowed to eat. But on this sheet was literally everything. And for those of us that like eating um, shellfish and maybe pork, we're thankful for this passage of Scripture, right? Because as this sheet comes down, God says to Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, whoa, wait a minute. God, I have, right, he gets all pious, self-righteous, and holy. He's like, God, I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And I, it's hard enough reading the scripture sometimes and getting rebuked by reading the scripture. I, I know it's a challenge. I'm, I'm the one that's generally the one saying this, but going back and listening to my sermons or hearing other sermons and hearing the rebuke from a pastor or a teacher when they read the word of God and you go, man, I am not living up to expectation. That's one thing to receive that rebuke. But can you imagine what it was like for Peter to say, oh, I've never eaten anything uncommon. I've never eaten e or anything common. I've never eaten anything unclean. And God looking at him and saying, you don't call anything common or unclean that I've blessed, that I've said is, is clean. Can you imagine what that had to be like for Peter to be rebuked in that way? And the reality is, is God takes him through that process three different times of him trying to understand that what God's expectations are, what God's truth is, is different from ours. I don't know if you guys acknowledge this in Peter's life as much as you acknowledge it in your life. Peter's hard-headed, but so are we. Sometimes it, it takes God really having to pound some truth in our head for us to really understand. Because, see, what, what's about to take place in Peter's life is going to be way out of his comfort zone. For what God is going to call Peter to do is to engage in a conversation with someone that he understands from what he's read in the Bible, his Old Testament understanding, that he can't have anything to do with Cornelius because he's unclean. That's one of the things that as, as Christians, we get into this mode and mindset sometimes where we think that we're in a position of being judge and jury. Uh, the way I, I've experienced in my growth is sometimes I get to this place where I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm understanding things biblically, and I think I've got a handle on things, and I feel like I can maybe be critical of someone or judge someone, and God has uh, no problem with bringing a little bit of humility in my life and showing me that he is greater than I am and that uh, without him... I'm nothing. And that because I'm saved is because of her, his mercy and grace and love. And that if anybody else is going to come to salvation, it's going to be because his mercy, grace, and love. And if he showed it to me, then I need to be willing to show it to anybody else. So the scripture says that, that Peter didn't understand it, right? Beginning of verse 17 says, Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision might mean. But then these guys show up and they explain everything that's going on. And Peter says, hey, you guys spend the night with me. We'll journey uh, to Cornelius' house the next day. And as they arrive, Cornelius is expecting Peter. That God has revealed himself to Cornelius, and Cornelius is ready to receive this. But what I love about this story, and I thought was a natural segue transition into the next uh, series that we'll be dealing with here uh, in, through May and into the first part of June is that when Cornelius knows that Peter is coming, when he understands the message that he's bringing, what does he do? He invites all of his relatives. He invites all of his friends. He invites all these people to come hear what Peter has to say. And that's what we need to be doing. I encourage you right now, if you're on social media, 
down the bottom right hand corner, click share. Right? It's just that simple. I know Jill has moved to doing a watch party for our, when we're doing our Sunday morning services to invite her friends. You know, it's really been cool. And if you're watching this morning, I've had family members that have actually watched our services that have never watched before. See, Cornelius knew the message was important. He knew the message was vital. He knew it was a message from God. And he wanted to make sure that everybody he had contact with would know about that. And what I think is amazing is he starts with his relatives. He starts with his family. That's the first group of people that he calls in and says, you've got to hear this message. You've got to hear what God has to say. And that's what we need to be doing as Christians is saying, hey, God has a message for us. He has a word for us. Even in the midst of this challenging situation, God has a word for us and he wants to reveal himself to us and he wants to bless us and he wants to guide us and direct us and God is involved in this we mentioned it last week mentioned it in Sunday school encourage you to go download the little uh, uh, little ebook that's out there you can listen to it if you like audio books by John Piper called the coronavirus in Christ right how how is God in the middle of all this and church he is and there are answers to the questions and do we believe in the sovereignty of God do we understand that God has everything under control that this does not surprise God this does not catch him off guard he knew that this was happening and he's in the middle of all this and he's got it all under control those messages need to go out from the body of Christ and what's amazing is they are and they're going out in ways that they never have before so just an opportunity for you to to click that share button or to start a watch party or just something to engage people through technology to say hey there is an answer to the questions that you face but then here it is again religion raising its ugly head Peter shows up and walks into the house and he says guys You all know it's all unlawful for me to be here right now because as a Jew, I'm not supposed to have communication with any other nation. And I don't know if it was on the journey to Cornelius' house. I don't know if it's when the guys showed up. I, I don't know when he has this revelation. I don't know when he finally goes, oh, wait a minute. That sheet that came down that had every person on it, all manner of animals on it, that I had a distinction, that I was in a position of judgment where I was calling some common and I was calling some unclean, that I was being judgmental of or critical of. It really wasn't about if it was a pig or if it was a shrimp or if it was a cow. It was about people. And I've said this before and I will say it again. I don't see how a Christian can be racist. I don't see how a Christian could be judgmental. And the reality is, is we all slip into it. That as Peter walked into that house, I, I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know where he was emotionally, but I know that he had gone through a shift. Did he completely go there? No, because we'll see him later on arguing with Paul about the ministry of the gospel to the Gentiles. There is still an argument. There is still conflict in his heart and his head about the gospel being available to everyone. But as Christians, the gospel, the good news, is available to everyone. And it's our responsibility to take it to everyone. We we can't decide who it is that we share the good news of the gospel with. That if God tells us to share the good news, then we share the good news. We are obedient. So Peter just steps up and is just quite honest with him. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. And then almost this confession where he says at the end of verse 28, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. James says it this way, if we hold anyone with respect of person, we commit sin. His visual was saying, oh, you're rich, you come sit in the good seat. Oh, you're poor, you go sit in the back. No, that's being judgmental. And that's what... God speaks through James is why do you put yourself in a position of judging do you not know that you commit sin see the reality is I've heard this before and it's probably cliche in Christendom but it's very true that the ground at the cross is level it's available for everyone the rich the poor the smart the not so smart the pretty the not so pretty it doesn't matter 
And I've shared this conversation before I had with a previous church member who we had this, I made that same statement, you can't call yourself a Christian and be racist. And they were like, Justin, you know, we need to talk. And I said, okay. And we sat down, we had a long conversation. And the end of the conversation was, I just asked the question, I said, what color is your heart? And this person looked at me and very confused. And I said, that's right. It, it looks the same, right? If you look at a human heart, it looks the same. And God explained that in his word. That God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He doesn't care what you look like on the outside. He looks at your heart. And as Christians, that should be the same for us. It doesn't matter what somebody looks like on the outside. It doesn't matter if they were raised in church. They weren't raised in church. It doesn't matter if they were religious or not religious. It doesn't matter if they're an atheist or a Jew. Or It doesn't matter. Our responsibility is, is to share the good news. And, and the reality is, is not everyone's going to receive it. Like The situation's not always going to be like Cornelius, that the soil is going to be well tilled and it's going to be receptive. We talk about it at Rockridge. Is, I always say it's low-hanging fruit. What I mean by that is those kids come to Rockridge and God's already working them through their children's ministry, through their families, and they come to Rockridge and they sing songs of praise and they're away from all the hindrances of this world and they get down there and God brings them to salvation. Not all those situations are going to be that way. The reality is, is some of them are. And who are we to judge on who's ready and who's not? It's our job to just share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because again, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. So Peter confesses and then says, I was sent for, I came without objection. And that's why I'm here. What am I supposed to tell you? And Cornelius says in this last section, what God had showed him and Cornelius says so at once I sent for you and you were kind enough to come now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord that's us church just being receptive that when God says move we move we're like Abraham when God says go we don't say where we just say when go yes sir will go and that's our our invitation this morning is just a call to obedience uh, the, the the hymn is entitled lord here am i and that's what we need to do one of the kid songs we used to sing in children's church all the time was yes lord we say yes lord yes lord yes yes lord yes lord yes lord yes yes lord it, it didn't doesn't matter what the question is the response from us as Christians is yes. Yes, Lord. Or this morning we'll sing, Here uh, am I. Lord, here am I. So as a Christian this morning, are we willing to go to those who we have determined don't deserve the Lord? Are we willing just to say yes, Lord, to whatever he calls us to do? And may that be our prayer this morning. Lord, here am I. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you. I just love this, this visual that you've given us for the obedience of Peter and the conflict of Peter and then the resolve of Peter to go to Cornelius and be obedient and to testify that, that he got it wrong. But he was willing to be obedient. And Father, maybe that's where we are today. Maybe we just need to confess we're wrong, that we've judged other people, that we've criticized other people, that we've said with our actions, maybe never with our words, that that person is not worthy of the gospel. And our attitudes, our actions, and our behaviors. And maybe now we just need to confess that this morning. And Father, with confession and repentance comes restoration. And as David said, Father, when you restore unto me the joy of of thy salvation, I will teach sinners their ways. Father, that should be the response when we confess and repent. You reveal your truth to us. We respond to it. You restore us. And we go forward and make a difference in our world. Father, may that be the heartbeat and mindset of believers today, that we would confess our sin, we would repent of our sin, you would restore us, and that, Father, our testimony would be, Lord, here am I. Father, your will be done in this moment, we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. pray together this morning father we thank you for that that truth that confession of the body of christ and lord i pray that 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 is our testimony this morning as a body of believers that we would say lord here am i father we just ask that as uh, we dismiss from our time together uh, that you would help us to fulfill that that call of obedience to take the gospel to wherever we can to wherever you lead us to to bring you glory and honor and praise we ask it and we pray it in jesus name Amen. Before you log off, we haven't been doing this, but one of the things that we love to do here at Bowden Baptist Church as we dismiss is sing a hymn together. And I think this is an appropriate uh, word for us to sing together this morning. So one more time, let's sing together as we dismiss our time. so much for joining us for worship today. It is our hope and prayer that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Take care. <laughs>